The April 23rd, 2024 regular meeting of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors is hereby called to order. We will now move on to the section 2.0, the land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish, Snohomish, and Tulalip peoples. We express our deepest respect and gratitude to the ancestors of this land on whose shoulders we stand. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. Thank you. We will now move on to section 3.0, the flag salute. Um, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you're wearing a hat and not in uniform, please remove it. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, will the secretary please call the roll? President Mitchell. Present. Vice President Herman. Present. Director Adkins. Present. Director Mason. Present. Director Revolinsky. Present. Student Representative Gilbertson. Present. Student Representative Kink. Present. Thank you. Uh, section 5.0 is adoption of the agenda. Dr. Saltzman, were there any changes to the agenda after it was published? Yes, Madam Chair. There have been two changes to the agenda. On item 13.03, review draft capital facilities plan 2024-2029. Minor changes made to the draft capital facilities plan item 15.01, naming of Everett High School Library, the photo college was added. Thank you. Um, is there any objection to the meeting agenda being adopted by general consent? Seeing none, the agenda is adopted by general consent. Section 6.0 recognition and the reason we love having these meetings. Uh, first is the recognition of the March Core Values Champions, Ms. Reeves. Good evening, um, President Mitchell, Board of Directors, and Dr. Salzman. I'm happy to bring to you the March Core Value Champions. The, the core value for March was diversity. And tonight we have three schools represented here tonight. All of the nominees from every school are listed on the website, but these three schools get to in, um, introduce their student for the evening. And um, we're going to have you come up and stay up front so we can take a picture. And then after I take a picture, family and friends, you can come up and take a picture. So we'll hold them there. We won't let them go until you're all done, OK? Um, so we are going to have um, Port Gardner and the um, teacher Jocelyn Sievers Bailey is going to be giving that award. And then we're going to have uh, Principal Tina Wood from View Ridge and Principal Laura Wellington from Heatherwood Middle School. Good evening, I'm Jocelyn Sievers Bailey from Port Gardner, and it is my great honor to um, welcome Nolan Wallace to come on up. I believe you're coming on up, buddy. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a handshake first. Then I have to read this and I'll give you the certificate, okay? Um, Nolan exemplifies being inclusive and accepting of all of those around him. He reaches out to be a friend to others, regardless of differences. We all appreciate Nolan at Port Gardner and how he embraces the diversity of ages and abilities to his fellow students, and he sets examples for others. Um, he got officially nominated by Celeste, um, but we all share this wonderful sentiment. And not only that, but Nolan is a hard worker, he's very smart, and he's an excellent baseball player. <laughs> so this is for you, my friend, and congratulations. <laughs> answered right up there. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor to call up Jane Hanasek. Come on up, Jane. Jane was actually nominated for this award by several teachers, and so they all had some things to say. So please um, excuse me as I read this long list of reasons why Jane is deserving of this award. Jane's exceptional qualities shine brightly through her acts of kindness and dedication. 
Since the arrival of a non-English speaking student in her class, Jane has extended her support wholeheartedly, ensuring his sense of belonging to the classroom community and access to the academic and social emotional learning taking place. Not only does she assist the student with translating directions, assignments and projects, but their camaraderie is evident through their frequent laughter filled interactions. Jane's friendship has been instrumental in the success of her peer at View Ridge, modeling great empathy and inclusion. Her unwavering integrity and kindness is visible throughout the classroom, creating a positive effect across the entire school environment. Additionally, Jane's eagerness to embrace challenges with a growth mindset reflects her commitment to learning and development. Her kindness extends beyond peers to adults and fellow students alike, fostering a culture of compassion. Her teachers share how fortunate they feel to witness Jane's dedication whether it be in academics or extracurricular activities, such as the running club, where her enthusiasm and commitment are exemplary. Moreover, her role as a dependable helper within academic groups, including her multilingual learner group, showcases her leadership and linguistic talent, utilizing her bilingual abilities to bridge communication gaps and foster a more inclusive learning environment. Jane's invaluable contributions make her a deserving recipient of this recognition. Congratulations, Jane. I'm proud of you for being a Viking hero and Everett Public Schools core champion. Good evening. I am the principal of Heatherwood Middle School. My name's Laura Wellington, and I would love for Miss Adeline Johnson to join me up here. It is an honor to celebrate Miss Adeline Johnson as our core value champion. Adeline is a sixth grade student at Heatherwood, and she is an incredible advocate for diversity and inclusion. Her dedication to fostering understanding and empathy among students is truly commendable. In fact, Adeline created a powerful video for Black History Month and has written inspirational and reflective poems that promote acceptance, respect, and kindness for all. Her care and commitment to bring daily diversity, equity, and inclusionary awareness radiates throughout our campus as we continue to grow and celebrate one another. Her positive energy, warm smile, and tenacious spirit makes her an authentic leader for others to look up to. She provides a welcoming platform for open discussions, discussions and makes it cool to be kind. Thank you, Adeline, for your tireless efforts in being a champion for diversity and making Heatherwood Middle School a more inclusive place for all students. Your passion for humanity and your dedication to pr promoting understanding are making a real difference in the lives of those around you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Let's see if I can see everybody. Perfect. Okay, one, two, three. Now nobody move. Parents, come on up. Take your pictures. Now we move on to the recognition of the 2023 Mayor's Art Education Award recipient and Ms. Reeves. Well, you just said what it is, so all I'm going to oh, do is introduce. No, 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 that's good. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Principal Kelly Shepard, and she will come up and introduce the award winner. Thank you, President Mitchell, school board directors, student representatives, and Dr. Saltzman for the opportunity to recognize Sarah Coyley for the Mayor's Art Award Art Educator. 
Mrs. Coyley is a phenomenal teacher, passionate about the arts, but more importantly, a believer in the magic for kids. She's connected to partnerships and supporting our students to develop life skills. In her awards art video, Sarah says, and I quote, it's about what I can provide students, provide so students can thrive and find their voice in the big scheme of this. None of this is about me, it's about the student voice. That really sums her up. She's inclusive and creates a welcoming space. Hugh Denny, a former drama parent member says, many kids participate in theater that don't fit in. Really good about, Mrs. Coy is really good about bringing them in and finding the, helping them find their tribe and be part of an organization. Bringing out the best in them as a student and as a performer. But the true student impact of Mrs. Coyley comes from the voices of her students. And I'm going to read a few quotes from them. So forgive me as I reread. Re Avery T, because we have two Averys involved in our drama program. Mrs. Coyley gets the best out of people. She knows how to get the best out of you, not just as an actor, but the tech people and us as humans. Naomi says, I was encouraged to, she, I, she encouraged me to join. She had the belief in me even when I didn't. Avery A reminds us, she pushes me to be my best human self. Ariel shared, uh, she pushes me outside of my box, even in the technical spaces. Annie tells us, it's amazing to hear the freshmen talk about, and this is where I quote her, how they never really felt like they had a place they were, or a space where they belonged, and now they're here and they feel like they are so included. All of this is because of the way Mrs. Coyley creates her environment. And our Booster Club president, Gina, says she embodies theater, that embodies the mission that theater skills are life skills. So, Mrs. Coyley, thank you for creating great humans through the amazing performances you create in drama. Congratulations on your Mayor's Art Award. I'm going to be in the picture. <laughs> Two and you're a little taller than the last group. <laughs> All right, ready? All right, thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. My, my daughter did theater, which is at Jackson, so. Congratulations. Important, yeah. Oh, it's so sad when everybody leaves. Um, section 7.0 is the superintendent. Yes, the superintendent's report. Dr. Saltzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board Directors, and the public this evening. And after those two presentations, uh, I can't follow those two um, <laughs> amazing presentations. But uh, I want to thank uh, all our library workers, our public school volunteers, our school bus drivers, and administrative professionals in our district. We celebrate our library workers on April 9th. These amazing staff members play a vital role in fostering a love for reading and learning among students while also managing valuable resources and providing essential support to educators. This week is Public Schools Volunteer Week. We have an amazing partnership with our PTSAs and parent groups. We recognize the invaluable contributions of volunteers who dedicate their time and efforts to support students teachers and staff in our public school system. They foster a sense of community and enhance the overall educational experience. Our office professionals in our schools and our offices, in our offices are the unsung heroes who keep operations running smoothly. And we are grateful for their dedication to supporting students and staff and community and the tireless efforts they put in hours all the time. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I got oh, oh, a few I'm Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I get the no problem. Shame on me. Uh, uh, school leaders, our community resource center is a, is a workspace for continuous collaboration. And we do what's best for students. We recently just had a gathering of all our administrators to expand our skills in supporting our multilingual learners and students with disabilities. We had many hours of collaboration and training. It was a worthwhile event. Uh, this is a challenge that we fully accept. The room was packed with school leaders working together and sharing thoughts and ideas. 
and it just makes the system great when everybody together is working towards one cause and one focus. Well, we have two family engagement events coming up this week. Our Natural Leaders Parent Orientation is this Friday, April 26th, and there will be two sessions, one in Spanish and the other in English. Our Natural Leaders help bridge some of the language barriers for our families in our schools. On Saturday, April 27th, families may join the Family Info Fair to learn more about student support services, such as IEPs, getting ready to transition from middle school to high school, disability awareness, and much more. And there'll be many fun activities as well. I want to keep our community involved. I want to thank everybody again, and I wish you a great evening and welcome to spring. Thank you. Yeah. Right, now, section 8.0 is board comments. Uh, Mr. Representative Kink, would you like to begin? Yeah. So I just got back from our school's robotics trip in Houston. We qualified for nationals, and it was a pretty good break. There was lots of sun, and we did pretty good, too. We made it to the semifinals of the qualification rounds, and our robot was performing really well. Um, other than that, I have nothing to say about our high school, but I thought I'd take the time to comment on the elementary schools, which I don't usually get the chance to. So I've been talking to my sister and her fellow classmates, asking like improvements they want to see at the schools. And they were all like, they all mutually agreed that the thing they wanted wanted to improve the most was the recess. So the recess recently got cut from 15 to 10 minutes. And personally, recess was like my favorite part of elementary. It's a big break in the day. Um, so I just think it's important for us um, as we move forward in like future schedule planning and stuff that we're hitting our full state requirements for recess so those students can get lots of good breaks and time outside. Thank you. Ms. Gilbertson. Um, so recently at Everett High, we had our spring prep assembly today and the school spirit was amazing. They had fun games that they had the spring sports teams participate in, as well as our golden apple awards were handed out to two teachers that got nominated. Um, as well as for like seniors this year has been a busy month of college field trips. So it's been fun to experience that I've gone on. We have three that went through this month, so and I get to go on all of those, which is fun, and it kind of helps me choose where I want to go. And then as well as kind of like a reminder for um, seniors is that if you plan on going to EVCC that the FAFSA for summer quarter is due soon <laughs> and that's about all I have to report. Thank you. Oh. Rovolinski. Okay, um, I feel like I did a lot since we last got together. Um, I got to learn with Miss Tress, Mr. Gunn, Dr. Scott, and um, I, I'm just so happy that you take the time to teach me. And um, Dr. Saltzman also, thank you for spending time teaching me. Uh, I got the opportunity to go to a couple multicultural nights. Um, one in particular was, or one, particular thing just kind of blew me away, which was a <coughs> poem that a student um, recited or performed at Jackson High School. Uh, she was so passionate. I was just, um, I was kind of overcome with emotion. Um, and I just, you know, I'm so proud of our diverse community here. And it's kind of timely, given that our core champions for this, for last month or for this month were diversity. Um, and so I'm just, um, so happy. Thank you. That's all I got. Okay, Ms. Mason. Thank you. Um, first, I want to congratulate Student Representative Kink and your team for your success. That's just so awesome to hear. I know um, it's a really big deal. So um, congratulations. And um, the state is on your side. They've actually are going to mandate 30 minutes of recess at every elementary school in our state. I think beginning next year. Is that correct, Jen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't know the timeline. Um, but anyhow, they're working on it. And um, let's see, I was able to have a little bit of fun. Um, so I, I dropped by the Everett High School student versus staff. <laughs> I just had to do that because my son played once. And it, it's just such a fun, um, energetic time uh, game. And then um, also attended the Everett High auction, which I guess is technically not a school event. but. Um, 
it was a really fun evening for us grown-ups, and more importantly, we raised a lot of money for the students. I mean, an impressive amount of money for students at Everett High School. So I'm looking forward to finding out and seeing where those funds go, because I know it's going to support a lot of um, different activities. So very fun. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I uh, just have a few events to share that I, I got the chance to attend over the past few weeks. Um, first, I got the exciting chance to attend the Washington State Indian Education uh, Annual Conference uh, down at Muckleshoot. Uh, it was a three-day conference um, earlier this month. It was just really great to hear uh, again from the uh, OSPI and Office of Native Education on just some of the efforts going on around. Indian Ed um, in the state. Uh, I also got the chance to go with some staff members uh, to visit Meadowdale High School and specifically the school based health center there um, down in Edmonds School District. And that was really exciting to get to see what will uh, be coming soon to uh, Everett High and Cascade High. And, um, and just what an exciting opportunity for our students to be able to uh, soon be able to access health care at their high school. Um, and then I got to go with Director Herman uh, yesterday to visit an ECAP classroom uh, down at Lowell Elementary. And uh, that was also just a really exciting uh, visit. And um, I never realized Lowell Elementary's hallway was so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, uh, that's everything I have to report. Thank you, Ms. Herman. <laughs> Yeah, the, the hallway at Lowell. Uh, yeah, big thank you to Director Ann Arnold and um, Tori Dowdy over at uh, at Lowell for taking the time to show us the inclusive inclusive e class classroom uh, and it, and the school itself. It was there was a nice tour around. If there were was any doubt that students are learning at that young age, it just goes goes out the window. It's amazing spending time with the three and four year olds and you can just see the wheels turning and so there's a there's a lot of great foundation happening there so hats off to the Lowell leopards for what they're doing there at the school. Thank you. Um, I just really hope everybody enjoyed a nice spring break. This is kind of a longer meeting tonight, so please bear with us and. Um, uh, along with some of the other directors and some staff um, went to the Everett Community College Foundation breakfast and I really just want to reflect on the the student um, who, who told a, a really touching story just to reaffirm that life doesn't happen in a straight line and I, 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 I've been to that event several times and just really the importance and how people find their way back to post-secondary education and it's it's not a straight line but but that young man has he knows he's known what he wants wanted to do for instance he was like nine or six years old and um it's just taken him a longer while to get there and i'm glad everett is community college is there for him and then miss gilbertson we were reminded not too long ago that you started along with the seniors all the other seniors your high school years in lockdown and the fact that you mentioned school spirit that is just how far we've come. And just thank you for sharing that story because you have accomplished a lot in four years along with your classmates and all the other seniors around. So just congratulations on that. So next we'll move on to public comment. Um, tonight we actually do have two public comments. I'm just gonna skip my, do we have any? Cause I know we do. Um, the school board sets aside 15 minutes during regular board meetings to hear from our constituents. We do this because we value public in input and want to hear and understand the perspectives you bring to the table. Each speaker has three minutes to speak. As board president, I have the responsibility to ensure our board meetings, board meetings and the conduct, the, <laughs> sorry, grammar, um, is, is where we do our business in public in an orderly, productive, and respectful manner. We welcome ideas and opinions uh, presented in that same manner. Thank you for helping me with this responsibility and the entire board welcomes you to this meeting. It, um, I'm going to welcome uh, Banish Aikubal. Can you leave us? Finish. Thank you. Oh, 
Okay, well, we'll move on to the second person just for the sake of time. Um, Mr. Day, if you can come up to the podium. So we, you will see three lights that appear um, when it's time for you to speak. A green light will, will um, show up. Um, please remember your words have an impact and you, not the school, on, on you, not the school district. We caution all speakers that it is impossible for, for your statements could violate the rights and others under various laws, including laws protecting privacy and laws prohibiting defamation. If you are unsure of the legal effects of your remarks, you should speak independent, seek independent legal advice. In any case, we ask you to help us be a model of respectful and inclusive community to our students. And so when the lights come up, you have three minutes. Um, so this is Mr. Steve Day, who is a parent of the district and wants to speak about religious songs in the school choir. So when the green light comes up, I've said this three times that I haven't finished my thought, I apologize. You have Thank three you. minutes and then the yellow light and then a red light. I'm here today to ask you to implement a new school district wide policy prohibiting the use of religious songs within choir curriculum. Now, why am I asking for that? I'll start with three examples of songs performed recently by the Heatherwood Choir. The first is Hakuna Manugu Kama Wiwi. Now, that song title literally translates into, there is no God like you. And the entirety of the lyrics have been summarized as a proclamation of God's greatness and power. The second example is, set me as a seal. The lyrics for that song were directly taken exclusively from a Bible verse. The third example is, can I ride, described in the choir program as a traditional spiritual. The lyrics focus on Christian themes exclusively, including the Lord, heaven, judgment day, resurrection, and sin. For non-religious families like mine, this is a big problem. We do not want our children forced to engage in worship or to repeatedly sing in support of others' religious beliefs that we do not share. You may not hear about this issue often because it can be scary to speak up due to fears of student bullying or retaliation from staff. But statistically, it's clear there must be plenty of other choir parents uncomfortable with religious songs in the curriculum, not just me. According to a Pew Research Center study published in January of this year, 28% of American adults have no religious affiliation, including 10% who, like me, expressly identify as atheist or agnostic. These choir songs are not optional, like the Pledge of Allegiance. They are the curriculum. And they aren't sung once. The songs selected are practiced over and over and then performed in front of large audiences. Participation is graded. There are only a small number of songs practiced by each choir at any given time. Sitting the religious songs out is not a reasonable option. I would never want my religious neighbor's kids to be forced to repeatedly sing songs espousing my atheist agnostic beliefs. As a caring, empathetic human, I think this would be a terrible idea. All religious beliefs, or lack thereof, are deeply personal and should be respected. All I ask is that my family has shown the same respect that we offer others, that we should all offer one another. Our public schools should be centers of tolerance and inclusion, not tools of division or exclusion. They should be open to and welcoming to all, regardless of religious belief or lack thereof. To that end, there are lots and lots of great songs without any reference to religion, positive or negative. Let's have our kids sing those. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Day, um, the regional superintendent, Larry Fleckenstein, is here. And um, I, you can, he, he will follow up with this. So thank you so much. Um, so, and um, Ms. Ikeball is no longer with us. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry, you, you're hiding. I'll welcome you up. Um, you didn't hear my preamble, um, but you'll have three minutes. I think you've spoken to us before. So um, you'll have three minutes to start, and you want to speak to us today about WSPTA advocacy and legislative priorities? Yes, exactly. So I'm, I'm Binish Iqbal, and I am representing Everett PTSA Council 7.3 here. I want to share the Washington State PTA advocacy priorities for um, next two years. The Washington State PTA 2023-24 legislature priorities are a two-year platform to mirror the Washington State legislative cycle. In October of even-numbered years, all new legislative issues are adopted by delegates at the top legislative assembly. Delegates also voted on their top five issues, which become Washington State PTA's primary focus when advocating throughout the next two years. 
these five priorities are um, something that will help our school districts to provide better education and atmosphere to our students and staff members. According to these five priorities, um, four issues that supports education system and two issues are directly focused on supporting school districts. So the top five priorities are addressing the student mental health crisis, addressing critical gaps in education funding, preventing and reducing gun violence and suicide, addressing funding, inclusion, and supports in a special education system, building and maintaining safer school facilities. We shall, we shall advocate for legislation or policies that help resolve critical education funding gaps and inequities with predictable progressive and sustainable revenue sources, including, but not limited to, student transportation, unfunded mandates to school districts, and school construction. We agreed to advocate for legislation or policies that support students with disabilities and their families by fully funding special education services with no caps on funding enrollment, promoting full inclusion in general education classrooms with high leverage teaching practices, simplifying the safety net reimbursement process to school districts. Based on OSPI's statistics, a single student costs $18,964 $18, per year in a classroom. That cost ranges from $17.75 to $105.35 um, when they graduate from high school. In this situation, we understand that it, it is tough to maintain the school facilities and nationwide, the average debt is increasing. At this point of time, nationwide, the average debt is 3% in the school districts. Therefore, we are advocating in legislation to provide support for building and maintaining safer school facilities, fund school safety changes, including emergency signs, improving indoor air quality, and other environmental hazards earthquake early warning systems in all schools i'm sorry your time is up and your what you have to say is so important with us if you can please share it with us with in writing because i I'm, we I'm only done. have three minutes this is my last yeah, yeah, we only have three minutes i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. I, I can't let you go on longer because that's just our rules i'm sorry i just have to thank this is my okay. last class yeah thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to share we can uh, you can support us by joining our pts okay. thank you but thank you so much yeah all right, um, section 10.0, legislative updates, and there are none for this meeting. Now this moves us on to section 11.0, the consent agenda. Dr. Saltzman, have you received any questions about the consent agenda items? Thank you, Madam Chair. In the case of this consent agenda, the superintendent's office did not receive any questions regarding the consent agenda. Okay, thank you, Dr. Saltzman. So first, does any director wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in the new business section of the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Now, <laughs> is there any objection to adopting the consent agenda by general consent? Seeing none, the consent agenda is approved by general consent. We will now move on to strategic progress monitoring and there is none for this meeting. And now section 13.0, information or discussion. Uh, Ms. Tress, the 2024 financial report? March, Thank you, Dr. Saltzman, President Mitchell, and Board of Directors. Tonight, I will be discussing the March 2024 financial report. Along with this presentation and tonight's consent agenda item, there is an accompanying March financial report with additional detailed information for your reference. I will review the details of the general fund, the district's main operating fund, its enrollment, revenues, expenditures, and fund balance, Additionally, I review the, review the district's four other major comprehensive funds, including the Capital Fund, the Debt Service Fund, the Associated Student Body Fund, or ASB Fund, and the Transportation Vehicle Fund. The 
The table on this slide represents the district annual average student, monthly annual average student enrollment. Annual average student enrollment is a, an average of our monthly enrollment, which typically differs from what we, what we typically talk about, which is our student head count, which is the number of students, number of students um, counted for each, each count day. Funding is based on this annual average student enrollment, and our annual average student FTE is expected to be higher than budget, but it's remaining flat from our first quarter projections overall. We have updated our assumptions for our special education enrollment and our transitional bilingual instruction program enrollment um, as, as in the January timeframe, which, which is reflected in our updated revenue and expenditure projections. This table represents the monthly three years of the monthly this table represents a three year monthly revenue trends, uh, monthly revenue trends. The blue, the blue dotted line represents this fiscal year and is following previous trends. We are anticipating a slight increase in our projected revenues approximately $400,000 driven by an increase in our miscellaneous revenues and our state, state special purpose revenues. We're seeing increases in our food and nutrition revenue actuals for this for the month of March, as well as our fees and our investment income overall driving these changes. Reviewing our monthly monthly expenditure projections, this again is our three year monthly uh, monthly expenditures uh, and the blue dotted line represents this year this fiscal year's expenditures. And you see the trend sort of uh, the trend doesn't follow a significant pattern and that's primarily due to the fact that we pay our material supplies and operating costs on a weekly basis or our MSOX cost, cost on a weekly basis. So depending on the month, we may have uh, four or five weeks overall. And so it'll, you'll see fluctuations in those expenditures. We are expecting a slight decrease in our overall um, projections from February, um, and that's primarily due to our actual expenditures and our staffing costs. However, we are still anticipating an increase, uh, our, our MSOX cost to be higher than our budgeted overall. Year to date, we've, we've spent about $2.4 million um, through March um, compared to a uh, higher compared to last year at this time. Our staffing costs are still projected to be lower than our budget. And year to date, we've spent about $300,000 less compared to last year at this time overall. What that means for our fund balance is we are anticipating a slight increase from our February projections due to the increase in our revenues and the decrease in our overall expenditures. And as assumptions change, that can significantly change our fund balance overall. Our March ending fund balance is $25.9 million. However, if you look at our three year monthly trend, we are seeing typical trends um, from prior years overall, where you see the high in our October due to our, due to our levy collections. And we'll see, we anticipate a high in, um, in April due to levy collections as well. Looking to our four other comprehensive funds, I'll start with the capital projects funds. This fund supports major capital activity, including capital projects and technology projects, which include replacement and modernizations of new buildings, one device life cycle management, building upgrades and roofing projects. The capital funds revenues are starting to shift um, to see uh, upticks in the October timeframe and the a April timeframe as we have no outstanding bonds to be issued. And so we'll, we'll see our fund balance shift um, based, on, uh, based on when our levy collections overall. We do, uh, we, the majority of our revenues are, are, are primarily from our capital levy and some from our state match. The capital, uh, the capital fund expenditures will fluctuate by the timing of projects throughout the year, and we'll possibly see a slight increase in our fund balance year over year to help support um, our school modernizations and school, re school replacements approved in our 2022 levy capital plan. Moving to our debt service fund, this supports um, our principal and interest for another bond cost. This balance will fluctuate based on our bond payment schedule, where you'll see an increase in October and that decline in December due to our principal and interest payments. We also have an, uh, uh, an interest payment in June as well. You'll see a, see a slight decline on our monthly fund balance trends. We do have sufficient fund balance to support our overall outstanding bonds, which is approximately $71.4 million at this time. Looking to our Associated Student Body Fund or our a ASB fund, um, our monthly trend, our, our three-year monthly trend has a little shift compared to what we um, have seen in the past. And we did see an uptick in our February fund balance and that's 
primarily due to the fact that we had additional fundraisers to help support some of the overnight trips planned at the end of the school year. But for the March fund balance, you're just going to start to see that downward trend in fund balance overall. Our transportation vehicle funds support the purchase of school buses, and our estimated depreciation revenue or state revenue will be about approximately $236,000. Uh, we had fun we had a capacity to purchase buses overall however um, due to the timing of when we are going to be receiving buses we don't anticipate to actually purchase any buses in this fiscal year and it'll be at the beginning of the next fiscal year under the contracted busing model all other state transportation is funded through our general fund overall thank you thank you are there any questions go ahead uh, Press quick quick question back on slide nine i think it is um, I, I had some questions around this for the capital facilities plan too, and, and going forward, the state match, we we receive that regular. It's not a one-time payment. Uh, no, we typically receive it throughout the year, uh, depending on what's in, depending on what's out, what construction out as what construction is out um, in the community because we receive it for um, construction projects that are happening within the community only new construction so it's as as we are paying out we are receiving that match as I, well I'd like to speak to that a little more and it's it oh. I don't think it's new construction so it's um we receive SCAP funds on um new and new projects so modernizations not on new <clears throat> not on new projects unless we're replacing a building in lieu of modernizing so for brand new schools we're not eligible for SCAP funds um, and those funds come in typically about towards the end of a project uh, because we have to spend our own monies first and then the state starts reimbursing us towards the end of that. So I would okay. say maybe uh, once the project is about 70 to 80 percent complete is when we start receiving our funds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Can I ask, don't go away. No. <laughs> Just for clarity on the... Um, so if we built a new elementary school, we wouldn't get SCAP funds, even though we're over capacity, over per permanent building capacity, whereas like at high school, we're not. And Correct. Okay. And I, didn't realize, I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, you know, at some point, we may well become eligible, but the... Um, what, what tips us into eligibility? Well, it's, it's when the state formula would provide for that. Okay. So the state um, assumes a certain square footage per student and we build our buildings larger than the state formulas would recognize. And because we've done that continually, and many school districts do, uh, we're not eligible for, um, for SCAP funds for new school projects. So they typically. changed the formula just this last legislative session, but I'm guessing not by a lot. Well, and the uh, variable that they changed was they increased the construction cost allocation, it's called the CCA. They raised it from 200 and something per square foot up to about 400. It should actually be around 600 to reflect real costs. That's one of the many variables in the SCAP funds. And then just lastly, when we get the um, funds, you mentioned around 70 to 80% of project completion, they start uh, providing funding. Yes. How long does that go on? How uh, <clears throat> until for, we receive all the monies? Is is there a project. set schedule or is it? Pardon me. Is there not a set schedule on it, or is it dependent project dependent? It's uh, project by project dependent. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank they you. They just uh, we submit the uh, paperwork to the state to uh, to get reimbursed, and it typically once a. Uh, school project is completed that we're receiving funds on, it'll still roll in for a few months after that. Thanks. Thank you for the clarification. I just have one quick question yeah. about MSOC. Yes. So you mentioned our spending has gone up. The state authorized more money, made it retroactive, but probably doesn't touch what we need. So that, yes. So the in, we did receive um, an inc we do anticipate an increase in revenue for our MSOC funding, which is updated in our projected revenue allocation, which we updated in our February projections once we knew what the allocation increase was. Okay, but our expenses still exceed what they increased us to. C correct. Just to confirm for the community. Yes. Okay, thank you. I have a question on yes, that one please. too, um, a follow up. So 
our MSOC expenditures are higher, but we also have more students. How is that reflected? So, I, I mean, I guess what I'm asking, are we spending the same amount per student, even though we have more students, it would obviously be higher this year than last year. I can, let me get back to you on that. I don't okay. know the answer per student, how much. Yeah, because the more students we have, the more we're obviously gonna spend on MSOC. And I'm and more some... curious about, you know, is our cost increasing per student and going up or, is it just a reflection of having more students in the district? And it depends yeah. on how you look at that specifically. Yeah. It's because really complicated you, with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I hear what yeah. you're saying. And yeah. let me get back to you on that information because um, my guess would be yes, but I wouldn't know overall yeah. just because. No, no worries. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to section 13.02 um, board draft board annual goals, Mr. Gunn. And I looked at this in draft and no wonder I'm tired. Or in the in before the meeting. All right, uh, good evening, uh, President Mitchell, uh, Dr. Salzman, members of the board. Um, tonight I am presenting to you for your consideration the draft board annual goals progress report for 2023-24. Um, these goals are the board's own goals uh, selected by the board itself last August, which are based on WASDA's uh, school board standards, the framework, uh, put out by WASDA to help school boards understand and apply common um, principles of good school governance. This report reflects the work of the board, uh, the superintendent and staff to help carry out the work of the board. Uh, the two most important processes reflected in this progress report are the strategic plan implementation, a series of four board study sessions are held from January through May providing information and updates on 16 strategic initiatives currently underway, along with opportunities to be engaged in various activities designed around these initiatives. And then also the um, instructional review process to uh, the process to conduct instructional reviews at all of our schools by sharing of data, classroom walks, debriefs, and preliminary action planning resulting from the process. The board and the entire district have accomplished, have accomplished uh, a lot this year and through oversight monitoring and advocacy. The board has continued with an ambitious program of monitoring the work of the district and the superintendent through board study sessions, presentations and reports. Under the board's leadership, the district is continuing to maintain a very solid financial foundation for our instructional and support programs in these challenging times. Um, the board members have also been strong advocates in support of legislation benefiting our district. This is a draft report, uh, progress report for the year. The final report is typically reviewed at your August summer workshop and then approved uh, later in the summer, usually at a board meeting in August. For, um, and actually in, um, at the August workshop, it's typically um, up for discussion and then modifications as needed. So with that, I would like to give you the opportunity to um, have convers a conversation around this to discuss the report and any comments or suggestions that you might have. You're not asked to approve it at this time, just review. Anyone have any questions or comments? Thank you for pulling this together and whoever went through and counted all the work sessions and study it, and everything. It I was a joint that. effort. Yeah. It's very nice. Um, a couple things um, <clears throat> that I noticed uh, looking through this. One was um, we had a January retreat, which is was sort of a pseudo add-on to our summer planning workshop. Yes. And I'm wondering if that might be a good addition under uh, 1B, where um, 
we're enhancing our board effectiveness um, through community engagement, board studies, et cetera. I like that. Yeah, that's a good point because because it really did with having two or new board members just sort of help us start out as, as a, as a yeah, team. it's very much like our summer workshop, just kind of a mini format yeah. and to onboard two new directors. Um, and then uh, under this is actually something probably more for our summer workshop, but I, when I look at one B and we talk about community engagement there. Um, number five is is all about community engagement. So I'm wondering, I feel like it's might maybe um, repetitive, but again, that's something that we can address when we look at our goals for next year. Okay. Um, and then, let's see, yeah, two other things. One is um, it mentioned in 1B three surveys, but did not specify which surveys. And I know we've done more than three in our district this year. <laughs> Um, and when I look down further um, at another one, it, it references the three surveys again, and it, it says budget, advisory groups, and web and communication. And if those are the three that 1B is referencing, um, I need a reminder of where those were and if we saw those results, because I'm not sure I remember. I might have missed them, but um, just to kind of review. Um, and then just lastly, I noticed that the instructional review series completed um, and analyzed and a summary process was listed under three different items. And maybe there is some crossover there, but I was wondering if um, maybe there's an opportunity to sort of dial in where that particular, rather than just kind of repetitively keep adding it under a yeah. bunch of different areas that if there was one where it really um, hit more the, um, the goal that we are trying to accomplish. Thank you. That's my feedback. Oh, thank you for reading it with such good detail because um, when things are repeated, then maybe I'm not as tired as I think I am. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't do something three times. Any Anyone else? I will say that I know we, we made this as our decision, but the fact that we used to have radial dials with the red yellow green and you know halfway through the year we we should it's okay to be yellow because we're sort of towards the end of the year but it is sort of nice to have those doesn't look like we're not like just having the list really is nice just to show that that how much we do but it is all through you all <coughs> and it's through all of your staff in yes. the buildings and all of the buildings that that you create this work for us as as um director Rovolinsky said that that you you teach us and so you help us be better board members and 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 we really do i i think i speak that we really do appreciate it and so thank you all for 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 this work okay thank you mike you're welcome so now i'm keeping you up there because you are going to review the draft capital facilities plan 2024 through 29 All right, good evening again. <clears throat> Tonight I am providing you with a preview of a draft capital facilities plan that will ultimately be presented to you for approval in late June. We update our capital facilities plan every two years and this is our year to do that. With that in mind, we have designed the presentation with three objectives uh, for you tonight. One is that, the, uh, that you will understand the key topics related to our capital facilities plan update process, uh, that you will have information about the draft capital facilities plan update before it goes live to the public on Snohomish County's website. Um, and that also you will have an opportunity for comments and questions before being requested to approve this plan in June. So a capital facilities plan is a uh, planning document identifying the public facilities needed 
to meet the needs of the projected growth over time. Uh, the Washington State Growth Management Act requires cities and counties to prepare a comprehensive plan, including capital facilities plans for all public facilities. And this is uh, public facilities of all types, including schools, as it relates to us. Um, Snohomish County requires that school districts prepare plans, capital facilities plans for school facilities every two years. And this process results in not only um, a plan being completed and approved by the school board and the county and usually city councils. It also establishes school impact and mitigation fees for new housing projects in, in our school district for the next two years. Um, just real quickly, I'm going to um, mention that I'm using the terms impact and mitigation fees uh, sometimes interchangeably. They're very similar fees, but they are different technically and legally. Um, and if you ever need or want more information about those, I can explain them. But essentially, they do the same thing. And it's where we, uh, as we require that uh, developers of new housing projects in our district uh, pay a mitigation fee to us or an impact fee to us to offset the impact that their development has on our district, usually in terms of the numbers of students that are generated from those. Um, those fees are determined by the Growth Management Act and something called SEPA, State Environmental Protection Act, and must be spent on projects that add capacity to our system. GMA fees can be spent district-wide. If it's a mitigation fees, which we only collect now in the city of Mill Creek, those fees have to be spent on projects that those students from those particular housing developments attend. We would rather have an impact fee that we can spend district-wide rather than a, an, an, a mitigation fee that has to be spent at a specific school. All right, what does a uh, capital facilities plan contain? It, uh, it has uh, all of the elements that a good planning document has, uh, contains. Student enrollment forecasts, inventory of our facilities, forecasts of the needs for new schools and sites, a six-year financing plan of those projects, um, that are necessary to serve the projected enrollment, and then also a 20-year plan, so a plan on all of the facilities that we think are needed at a much higher level without necessarily identifying the funding for that. That's out 20 years. So a six-year financing plan, a 20-year plan of facilities. It also includes updated student generate calculations. We hire a consultant to produce those. And then uh, from all that, we plug variables that are associated with all of those pieces into some formulas and it generates the um, impact fee calculations for that. Um, the, uh, importantly, the one item that this plan does not contain is a school by school, grade level by grade level uh, comparison of the enrollments versus capacities over time. That's the kind of document that we would use to, to uh, plan for future bonds and levies and to understand uh, you know, how enrollments will affect our schools on a very uh, tactical level. This plan is really at a higher level, looks at system-wide needs and planning. The update process for this ca capital facilities plan, we are um, at the first item there, April 23rd, the board reviews the first draft. Uh, the, pla the draft is due to the uh, Snohomish County by the end of the month, and then May 10 is when the county will be posting up on their website uh, the draft plans from all of the school districts in Snohomish County. So that's one of the reasons we're here in front of you today. Uh, fairly early in the process, we wanted you to see and hear about this before our community hears and sees, about it, sees it and hears about it. Um, for the next couple of months after that, we will conduct a SEPA review of, of the um, capital facilities plan. So you may remember that before a governmental entity approves any action that may have a significant adverse impact on the environment, they have to uh, go through a SEPA review. So that's what we're doing. Um, and then we, ex we will ask you to consider approving that capital facilities plan June 25th. Then that will go to Snohomish County uh, Planning Commission for 
public hearing and review. They will make a recommendation probably to adopt it to the county council. And then the county council will also hold a hearing and uh, approve the plan, we hope, uh, November and December. And then at that point, it goes to the city of Everett for approval as well. And the new fees will go into effect January 1 of 25 and be in effect for the next two years. We will then send the approved plan to the city of Mill Creek and ask them to consider adopting that as part of their comprehensive plan um, <clears throat> as well. Uh, enrollment projections, you've seen this and we've talked about it numerous times, just wanted to review. This is in this, uh, the enrollments that are reflective of the medium range projections, the, the line in green, that is in our plan. Um, we also include projections from OSPI, but you can see those really kind of uh, decline over time. And it, again, that has to do with the difference in methodology between OSPI and Les Kendrick's projections. We have much more confidence in Les Kendrick's projections than OSPI's at this point. Uh, this is the results of that study produced by uh, our consultant. Um, and this is, a, we are seeing some changes here. This is um, an analysis that shows based on an, uh, new housing units, how many students end up attending our schools in those units. Um, so I'm gonna focus on, just for a moment, for an example, on the single family row. Um, it shows the breakdown of how many uh, students would be generated at the elementary, middle, and high school level, and then the total uh, from a single family home, a new one. And the way I like to think about that is I always uh, think about it in terms of 100 units. So if 100 single family homes were built in a development, it would generate, uh, on the average, about 66 students in that 100 unit development. 41 would be elementary, 15 would be middle school, and 10 would be high school. So that's, so when you see a housing development going in with 100 homes, it, it's, it's really big, right? Um, it, but it doesn't generate, you know, 100 elementary school kids, it generates 40, 41 on the average. Um, the uh, facilities needs that are identified um, in the six year funding plan that we built into this capital facilities plan are the same projects that are in the 2022 capital levy. I think there are a few more in there, but these are the primary projects. Um, we break it, we separate it according to projects that add capacity versus that this versus those that don't, um, because we can only include the projects that add capacity into the formulas that calculate the fees, not for all the projects, but just those that add capacity. Also, the formulas are designed so that you are only eligible for uh, fees on at certain grade levels if you're um, over capacity over your permanent building capacity and if you're growing during that six year time frame for the funding of the plan so, so those are, can i ask just i'm sorry yes. to interrupt but yeah. you have jackson elementary and madison the first two bullets on both yeah. adding and not adding can you add some clarity to that oh yes because the only parts of those schools that add New capacity are the additions of classrooms. Okay. The modernization component doesn't add capacity, it just replaces capacity. Okay, thank yeah. you. It's kind of a distinction there, but okay. All right, um, so the variables and the implications uh, of those variables uh, on the f f formulas for calculating the fees. Uh, we use enrollment capacity projections, uh, new schools or classrooms needed for new students. So again, we have to be growing and we have to be building new classroom space to house those kids or uh, purchasing property to do so. It also uses the cost of construction, the cost to acquire property, the student generation rates, and then in the formulas, there's, there are also some credits built in that give the developers a credit in the fee calculations for SCAP funds. And then also um, 
for future property taxes that will be paid by the owners of those properties. And then to cap it off, uh, the formula, the ordinance that Snohomish County passed uh, 25, 30 years ago requires a 50% reduction in the fee at, at the end of all that. And that is to um, account for potential discrepancies in the fees that would or could have generated legal uh, challenges to the way it's calculated. Um, school districts, uh, developers, and the county many years ago negotiated a uh, reduction of 50% to settle the legal claims of all the parties in the process. That's how that became, that's how that came to be. Um, the, uh, just to give you an idea, the uh, impacts and mitigation fees uh, in our capital fund have accounted for about 3% uh, over the last 10 years, 12 million out of 363 million. 3% doesn't sound like much, but it's, it's, um, it, is, it adds up to a lot, $12 million. We would not want to, to give that up. And that, again, the project, the fee, those fees must be spent on projects that add capacity for more students. There's also a time limit on how long you have to spend it. I think it's five to six years, depending on if it's mitigation or impact fees. So here are the current uh, impact fees. So the ones that are in place right now that were approved a year and a half ago and will go, are, though they're in effect until the end of this calendar year. Everett, uh, our single family rate is $6,286 for a single family and for a multifamily two or more bedroom unit, it's $3,834. That is the current fee. You can see North Shore is up at the high end of almost 18,000 and on single family and some districts are at zero. And I wanted to mention the reason that some school districts are at zero is, is again, uh, in order to be eligible, you have to be growing. So if your enrollment is not increasing, you cannot collect. You're not eligible. And that's an example there would be Marysville. They don't probably show growth at this point over the next six years. You also have to have unhoused students during that six years. And then you have to be planning to build new space to accommodate those students. Um, so if you don't meet those criteria, you, you cannot charge. So uh, looking at those numbers, here are the new fees that we expect to be uh, coming through from this uh, capital facilities plan update. We have, we've shown a range. I can tell you what the specific numbers are in the current draft. It may change a bit, so that's why we've uh, shown the range. The um, single family, the number that is actually in the plan at this moment is $8,909. So remember the current fee uh, for a single family is 6,286. It's gonna go up by a couple thousand up to 8,909. If the, uh, you know, unless the plan is, the numbers change a little bit. The uh, multifamily with two or more bedrooms are going to, uh, the range is shown from 2,000 to 5,000. The current fee is 3,834. We expect it's going to go down a little, little bit to 2,636. So single family rates are going up in our district. Multifamilies are going down. We've kicked this around in our department why that would be. And it's all related to um, the formulas, the, um, the nuances of the formula, depending on what projects you put in there and that you're planning to do will dictate how the fees come out. Along with the uh, student generation rates, those have a lot of impact on the, on the numbers there too. Um, I did want to remind you this includes the 50% reduction. So these numbers were twice those amounts and then reduced 50% per the ordinance. Um, and they will go into effect January 1st of 2025 and we will finalize these numbers for your consideration. Uh, at the board meeting on June 25. That's what we expect to do. And with that, I will finish the uh, presentation and uh, allow for any questions or comments. Mike, thank you for clarifying this is really strategy and not the tactics of how we are gonna house our students. And also alleviating me of my, some of my angst as I drive Sunset and our property along Both River Highway as I see huge swaths of land cleared that it might not bring a lot of kids Right. In fact, I've, I've seen one. It's um, as you head towards uh, 
uh, Tenbar Creek Elementary, I think there's about a 20 unit development. It looks like a lot of work, but it, 20 kids times 0.6 is uh, what, 12 students yeah. or something? So it's, it's just yeah. thank you for alleviating again yes. those fears when You're I welcome. see large swaths of land, what appears to be large swaths of land. Are there any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. Okay, great, thanks. Um, a couple of questions on the capital facilities plan document that went along. Yes. Um, I had forgotten about the sound transit light rail expansion and possibly uh, the losing that bus facility. What timeline for those decisions? I, I just don't remember. It's, um, it's a long time. Um, I answered that question uh, recently. And what I can tell you is that the timeline for completion of this project goes out to about the year 2041. Okay depending on funding. So that means if they get funding on time, the new then, link light rail extension from Linwood to Everett will be open for business in 2041. Right. However, um, they will be, if they, they will be telling us whether or not they want to acquire our bus facility site, probably by 2026, oh. about two years. Yeah. And at that point is when they will would start acquisition, the acquisition process, and it would start us on the road to having to identify uh, property somewhere, hopefully in the near the central part of our district, to acquire and build a central bus facility. And I can tell you, it was not an easy thing to do when we did it with the uh, facility out by Boeing that we have right now. Um, one of the big challenges there is getting land that has the correct zoning. Yeah. So we have already done some preliminary uh, evaluations of the zoning maps of Snohomish County and the city of Everett and the city of Mill Creek. And it's not very, um, it's not, there are not a lot of options out there. Mm -hmm. But so I would say a couple years we would need to, we would get the, uh, information from Sound Transit about whether they're going to pursue our property or not. Okay, perfect. And I, know I think we're only one of four. There, there's other choices too. So um, yes, sir. We'll, we'll see on that. Uh, the the flow analytics for the student generation rates, mm -hmm. that's actually very recent. That was April. Um, does that, does their methodology, methodology match Les Kendrick's? Is so, that the same? So Les Kendrick does in, um, he does student um, prediction of the students that will be coming to the school district. What Flow Analytics does is look at how many students will live in housing. So yeah. I would say this, um, Les Kendrick uses the uh, student generation rates provided by Flow in his okay. calculations. Okay. So they complement one each other. Yeah. Yes, they, they do. should. They yeah. should match on yeah, those. They do. Okay. Um, Okay, and then the last question with the change in the SCAP formula, the, the increase, we are anticipating $10 million additional funding between 26 and 29 for capital. Yes. yes. Um, do we already, so we're incorporating that, do we already have projects signed up? Now, some of that, correct me if I'm wrong, will be, will be used for the increases in costs for Jackson Elementary. Yes, and, and other projects. So, yes, I'm kind of, yes. <laughs> okay, I wasn't True. sure if we had a priority list that we might be able to um, already start looking at, if that's, or that, it's too soon, I'm sure. It but, is, it um, is too soon. Um, the, um, so I would just characterize it by saying we really appreciate and can use the additional SCAP funds. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, we will spend every penny we have in the capital fund for the benefit of our, of our students. And we will certainly be bringing conversations to the board about how to do that over time. Certainly we want to get far enough along in our current levy program before we, you know, uh, ta start talking about what else to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Oh, continue. Sorry. I forgot one. Um, HVAC systems. Uh, was there any, uh, any additional opportunity for state grants? Uh, that came out that you're aware of between perhaps Department of Commerce, because um, I was just thinking back to a conversation we had with one of our legislators mm -hmm. that that could possibly be coming from when we see the costs associated with Clean Buildings Act. 
Yeah, um, I think that there are grant opportunities uh, coming out from at the state and federal level. Um, and one thing you'll be hearing about on March 7th, I, it's at the uh, workshop. The workshop on the strategic initiatives when we bring sustainability back for an update. We'll be talking with you about some research that we've done in uh, for partnerships and grants. It's, it's not going to be the whole story. So the answer is yes, there is more funding of coming out, we're hearing. There's not a specific uh, program that we're planning to uh, apply for right now. We, we are keeping our eyes open and that is, uh, in my view, it's, it's very much going to be built into the action plans for the various departments. This implementation of, t of sustainability uh, plans for next year and the year after. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Gunn. You're welcome. And now we'll move on to section 13.04, communications and community <coughs> engagement update, Ms. Reeves. I love all the pictures you put in all the presentations of all the families and kids, so thank you. This is a time I get to actually stand up here and speak instead of just introduce other people, so I'm yeah. excited about this. If I can find my presentation, there it is. Okay. <clears throat> Forgive me for the cough drop, it's preferable to other options. Um, President Mitchell, Board of Directors, Dr. Salzman, thank you for the opportunity to share tonight our annual update about communications to the board. As I mentioned, I'm very excited to actually get to share some information tonight rather than just introducing people, but the introducing people throughout this year has been very, very fun. So I'm not going to complain about that one bit. We are going to review tonight um, some information about community engagement. We're going to look at external communications and internal communications, the celebrations, which we just talked about, um, some ways in which we've been training others in communications, and then upcoming projects. And really the role of the communications department is to just amplify the why and the we of the work that gets done. And hopefully you'll see that throughout this presentation. So the first part is community engagement. And um, community, community engagement is, is a two-way um, dialogue. And it, if it's done well, it documents what you heard and what the action steps will be as a result of that. And um, we also, I'll share in a minute, that we even have some ways that we've been um, getting customer service rankings on some of our engagement as well. Um, the, the engagement I'm talking about is primarily the district's engagement with families. So the most of the community and family engagement happens at the school level. And that's more appropriate because it's the staff and the principal at those schools. So um, that's not going to be touched on here. You've heard some of that from some other presentations. This is really the district um, engagement with families. Um, we've done this through surveys, which we're going to touch on in a second. Um, the three surveys that we have um, done, I'll share where we can find the results for those two. Um, we've done advisory councils and we have Let's Talk, which is an application on our website. And then we've done um, Let's Connect meetings. So the first piece, the three surveys that we refer to, um, one is about uh, the website and communications. That is because we knew that this year we were going to have to do some website redesign. So we wanted to make sure to get input on um, usability and navigation to see if there's any changes we need to make. The advisory councils we do every spring, I mean every fall, to refresh membership. Um, plus, as you can see on the right hand side, this year we have three new advisory councils. So we had to um, solicit membership for those as well. So the Capital Facilities Advisory Council, the Sustainability Advisory Council, and the Student Nutrition and Physical Health Advisory Council are all, all new this year. So one of the surveys we did was just to gather interest in those. And then the third one was a budget survey. I gave you an example here 
of the website and communication survey so you can see the type of questions that we asked. Um, we always want to know how to reach people better because no matter how many times you share information, you still have people to say, I never heard about that or I didn't know that was happening. And so we really try to find out better ways. And you can see from this question here, most of the people by far who answered the question, how do you receive your information or would you like to receive their information? It's from email and e newsletters from their schools. So. This is a type of information we can pass on to the schools so they know how to better reach their families as well. But if you go to the, um, the district website and you go to community up at the top and you click on that page, on the right hand side, there's a quick link for engagement. And on that engagement page, you have all the different surveys we've done and also the let's connect that we've done where we've taken notes and the results are on that page. So the budget and the um, website communication survey results are on that page, not the advisory council since that was really just a solicitation of members, but that's where those surveys can be found. And I mentioned let's talk. So when you go onto our website and you see that little, um, it used to be a cute little chat bot chat head down there. Now it just says get help. And I'll tell you that we made this change about six weeks ago um, and it has actually reduced our spam immensely because that chat bot chat was just so cute we were getting lots of people trying to talk to it so now this is very specific if you need help this is where you click so there's two ways that this program works one is you click the get help and you write your question in and it's an automatic um, uh, like frequently asked questions. So how do I get, this time of year we get a lot of, how do I get my transcript? That's a question we get tons and tons and tons. So we can just put the answer in there and that automatically pops back. If there's a question they ask like two times and they don't get the right answer, then the, the thing says, would you like to speak to somebody? And that's when an email will go directly to a staff member. And as you can see from um, up above, we have a 48 hour response goal that we would like to see on those emails. Right now, our average dialogue is 1.3 days. So we're beating our goal. These are work days, by the way. And at the end of your engagement, you can rate um, on a scale of one to 10 how well the staff did at replying to the questions. And so at the moment that I chose to look at this, it was really good, it was 9.9, .9, so we were doing really well. I picked out two different samples of what people said we were doing well on these emails that get sent to staff. And one of the students said, I picked a 10 because of how fast and simple it was. They listened and I got what I needed and it's all good. And the parent said, the services are very quick and they care for my request to a high level and your service is very perfect. I love your interaction and your cooperation. So I think this has really helped people who may feel frustrated and not knowing how to get an answer to something to get an answer more quickly. And um, just today, actually, so don't go look at it tonight. Wait, give me a couple days. Um, but just today, let's talk changed our um, get help button to a generative AI system. So now instead of like previously, I would have to go in and say, how do I get my transcript? And then I'd have to type in an answer. And then I'd say, uh, how do I get my high school transcript? And I'd like write about 10 different ways to ask the same question. Well, now it's supposed to be smarter so it can figure out without the exact words. And also we can upload a document. So today I tried, I uploaded the student handbook. And apparently if you ask a question that's answered in the student <coughs> handbook, it's supposed to be able to pull that out. So we'll see in the next month or so how that works. But like I said, it just launched today. So give it, um, give it a little bit of time. The Let's Connect, which are community engagement meetings, we had two this year in October. It was about how the strategic plan is implemented in schools 
And then in February, we had promoting healthy digital habits. The February one, which we had a professor from the UW come speak, was recorded and it's on Parent University. Plus it's also been um, promoted through many different platforms as well. We also have um, engaged with the Family Engagement Advisory Council to get ideas about potential topics for next year. So um, you'll see some of those probably this summer. Those, those will get discussed. So now we move to external communications. So a big part of what we do is external communications and th that would include our communication plans, our monthly newsletters, press releases and media relations, parent university, which I mentioned, semester e-newsletters and social media. So one thing we did different this year, trying to be much more proactive and not always reactive, is um, in August we met with all of the departments that have kind of the standard typical schedule of needing certain promotions. So we know assessment always needs to have certain promotions given. We know that um, uh, CTE has a CTE month and we're going to want to do something there. So we met with each department and put together a huge spreadsheet based on how and when we're going to communicate for them. So this helped them because they knew this is coming. And it also helped us because we were able to plan better and get things sequenced better. And these were down to even the point of, you know, is it a 10 o'clock social media post or is it a one o'clock social media post? So it was really thorough, it helped really well. It also gave us time to address the topical ones as they arise, things you might not have expected. So last fall or last summer, we didn't know that we'd probably be doing a communication plan for school-based health centers, right? So things like that that come up that you know you're gonna have to participate in, you have more time to work on that because your standard ones are already prepared and um, scheduled. So um, that is external communication plans. For the monthly school newsletters, what we do for that is we create every month um, content that goes to the different schools so they can put it in their newsletter to send home to families. This does several things. It helps with consistent messaging throughout the district. It helps the schools know what we think are priorities for the families to hear. It also makes it one step easier for the principals and the office managers because they don't have to try to, you know, we don't say, oh, write something about school safety. We write it for them and they can just put it in there and it's done. So it makes it a lot easier for them. One example, which you'll see in a second, is um, when we talked about what is a lockdown versus a lockout, because that's something that every family needs to know and wants to know. And so we made a video and we embedded it in their newsletter so every family got to see um, that video. This is the media page. So there's two different pieces of media. One is the press releases and one is media relations. Um, the press releases are things that we write to send out to, um, the, to the media. We send it to staff, we send it to the board. Information about awards, recognitions, student achievement, things that we want to celebrate that are going well. Um, events, classroom projects, things like that. Um, we have tried to tell our story better this year and to tell it more. So hopefully you've noticed that. This, it says 28 press releases since August, but I think we've had four in the last two weeks. So we're over 30 now on press releases that we send out. Now this is just, um, it's not real targeted. It's just, let's get our story out there so people can see it. The media relations piece is a little more complicated. Um, this is, um, this is a two way thing. So the first part is, is we have to manage media requests. So when we get a call from a TV station and they say, hey, we want to talk to somebody about X, not not X, actually, but just whatever. <laughs> and um, then we have to decide, OK, who would say it? What would they say? How would they say it? When is the best time to say it or do we want to say it at all? So it's managing those media requests. One thing that's important related to that is to keep up to date on who the current reporters are. Every reporter has their own, I mean, just like we all have our own specialties and our own ideas, every reporter has those too. So you have to know kind of what their bent are is and also what their station or their publication is, is thinking about as well. So it's important to keep up on that. And believe me, they change a lot. This year they've changed a lot. 
but also you have to have an idea of what the regional news stories are because you you know if, if there's a big story about this over here and this person comes and kind of tries to get a back door you you have to know okay i'm sure that this is because it's related to this so it's really important to keep up to date on all of those um, but in that realm of media relations is also pitching a story so this is different from a press release because it's very targeted you have an idea of what would be a fantastic story and you come up with the reporter that would best tell that story for you and you call them and you talk to them and you tell them why and this is an example um, so actually this story was pitched based on the um, walk kids scores that we had this year that were great we wanted to talk about all of our um, our early learning programs it ended up being primarily about TK, but you know the story got out there. It was a great story, front page, and um, really turned out well. You know we don't write it, so we can't put it exactly in there what we want. Um, but this was the result of one of those media pitches. And we talked about parent university, so that's where we put videos. Um, that help community and parents learn about things that are important that they need to know about. Um, this year so far, we've done 16 of those videos, a uh, total of tw over 1,200 views for those videos. These are shared on social and newsletters and in announcements. Some of the topics you can see, uh, Summer Academy, a Meta Moment, the State of the Schools presentation, PSAT, What is Ruler, CET, CTE, and et cetera. And you can see up there that um, Sergeant Fletcher and Topher Ferreira got our Grammy Award this year because they got the highest number of views. So they, um, they won the award for this year. So hopefully we'll see some new awards next year as well. Um, semester E newsletters, those we implemented last year for the first time. We send out a big e email newsletter to all our families the, about a week before school starts with all the things they need to know about the new year. And then we started doing that right before the second um, semester as well. And we have, you know, around, well, a little less than 20,000 families or students, but we have almost 38,000 views on some of them. So they must be really good because they read them more than once. Um, and then 25,000 for the second one. So social media, which is one that everybody is familiar with. There's several parts that we do for social media. One is that we run all the district accounts. So um, you can actually see down at the bottom, those are the district account stats. So from February to February, Facebook increased at 6%, um, X increased at 1%, Instagram at 14%. So that's where we reach most of our students. And then our mobile app increased by 6%. The other really heavy lift is to monitor and connect all of the school accounts so there are a lot of accounts out there that aren't like verified ever public schools accounts but um, each of the schools if it's run by an admin and they've they've um, registered them with us they're part of this list and we do the archiving and the biggest piece is we support transitions so if um, let's say that a principal is at well, well, let's say they're at Cedarwood and they run a um, Instagram account based on what? Your email address, right? Because you can't open a social media account without an email address. And then you retire. Well, what do you do? How do you still have an Instagram account for Cedarwood? You have to go through tons and tons and tons of red tape to try to get it transferred to somebody else and prove that you are who you are and do all these different things with phone numbers and so actually a lot of time is spent trying to help keep those things straight and clear so for the whole district that we have verified we have 16 facebook accounts 61 x accounts and 25 instagram accounts internal communications as you would expect is very similar to external communications um, the, the key here is that we really want to make sure that internal knows things before it goes external. So this is more about um, timing and sequencing and messaging so that if something goes external, the internal folks know how to answer questions regarding it. Um, some things might just be for internal, like if we say something about the emergency operations center, that probably would be something that would probably stay internal. But in general, it's, it's really about making sure, and even internal has sequencing. So we often let the 
administrators get a message before it goes to staff because what happens when the staff get a message they run right to the administrator and say what is this all about so you have to make sure that the sequencing happens properly um, this year we started docs dugout so last spring we did a communication survey and the lowest ranking piece was um, that people felt like staff felt like they didn't know enough about the district business they wanted to know more about the business of the district. So we put in this docs dugout this year to just talk about the business. There's a little bit of, you know, rah rah in there, but really it's a it's a kind of a business email. It talks about scores and it talks about budget and it talks about things that we do every day, facilities, things like that, um, that that they're really anxious to know about. So we started that doing it monthly. Um, and it averages more than 3,500 views per issue. And if you're curious, we have around 2,500 staff. And then the rest of the internal work is just all staff emails, working on the staff website, because there is a, another part of the website that's behind um, uh, your staff email that the public can't get to, and then Blackboard Connect messages. Celebration. So that's what we all talked about that we've enjoyed so much this year. We really have tried to tell our stories better. I hope you feel like besides even core values, we've had a lot of recognitions this year and uh, we are going to have a lot more. We still have two months left, so there's many more coming. Um, but the core value champions has been such a hit with the families and the kids. It's been fantastic. Um, we've been trying to sell send celebrations out in the press releases and media pitches um, via social media and also on the website we have this new page it's the celebration web page um, where we try to link some of those good stories and we talk about the core value champions and then we talk about celebrations so there's a place if you're ever feeling kind of blue you go to the celebrations page and you'll feel a lot better we also spend time training others because there's three of us in the communications department, so we can't help everybody all the time. We need to train them to do some of the work as well. Um, we have monthly social media drop-in sessions. Now, of course, also, anytime we can help. It's not like this isn't the right day of the month. We can't help you. Anytime you need help, we can, we can do that. But there's scheduled drop-in sessions for um, social media. We have a Canvas portal with communication modules in it. We do a brand champion training every year with our brand standards guide. Uh, we do individual trainings for the website, Blackboard Connect, which is our mass messaging system, uh, Canva, which is a design um, platform, the S'more newsletter, and then I believe you heard last week during um, professional learning that pairs have required um, training through the state, so we run the communication course that is part of their requirement. Now here's the big thing. These are things that are upcoming and I hope this isn't um, too overwhelming. I tried to make it very clear to understand, but we have some big projects coming up. I mentioned that we knew we were going to have to change part of the website. So if you were here a few years ago, you know that in 2020, we changed our website pretty completely. Um, it sits on the platform from Blackboard Connect which has been purchased by Final Sight. So we have to change our platform over to Final Sight. We're doing this in a way that the external user really won't notice much of a difference. It's going to look very, very similar. Some of the colors are going to change and a few of the little navigations. But in general, the feedback is it's, it's great the way it is. We're going to leave it as much as possible, which is good since so many other things are changing. Um, then we have the mass messaging system, which is also Blackboard Connect, which is when we do that dial out, there's snow today, you don't have school, that's through that mass messaging. Remind is what teachers and coaches use to text back and forth um, with their families and students, and then our mobile app, which is also Blackboard Connect. So all three of those are going to become Parent Square. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each of these in a second. Um, so we're going to have final site, we're going to have parent square, and at the same time, the food and nutrition platform is changing. So that's the one that keeps track of your balance, but also this new system can um, 
send out electronic notifications about balances instead of sticking the papers in the backpacks. So they're moving to Heartland School Solutions. And then as you have heard, our student information system is changing to Synergy as well. So these are some major, major changes, um, but they are sequenced and not all of them are, like I said, are public facing. So right now, the most active change is with the parent square piece. We have actually started training staff on it this week. Um, it's going to be trained throughout the spring and uh, remind is gonna be turned off June 1st or July 1st, July 1st. So it goes throughout the school year. Um, we have training set up for families, we have, or for staff, we have communication ready, and we have training plans for families as well. Um, the mass messaging system, because it is attached to our attendance phone calls and the wake up phone calls, we're keeping that live through September, even though we're transitioning it sooner, just so people can, just so we have a good summer transition. Um, the website is, we're working right now on starting to train staff because although it's very similar user facing, it is really complicated on the back end. So whoever has to go in and make changes in the website need to learn a whole new system. So we're starting those trainings this summer. The nice thing is, is that we're piggybacking it with trainings that are already for the most part scheduled. So when the office managers have their meeting, we're gonna go in and talk about the website. And when they we have the Institute in August, we're gonna go in and tell the principals how to do it then. So we're not adding a bunch of things, we're just piggybacking on things that are already there. <clears throat> so for the launch, you can see here, Parent Square is launching this summer. Heartland is launching probably mid to late summer. Final site, which is the website, will launch right before school starts. I know it's crazy. And Synergy, luckily, we have a whole year till that happens. So um, I think we have a great team working on it. Two teams, communications and technology. We're working together on all these. And um, we've got our training set, and we've got our communication set, and um, it's going to be good and they're going to be really, really improved products. I'll just tell you one thing real quick, like this Parent Square app, you can um, you can choose to have it be one way. So if I want to send you know a message to Director Herman, I can choose whether or not she can reply. So you don't have to let it be replied. But if I choose that she can reply and let's say that she only speaks Chinese on her app, she can have Chinese chosen. And when it goes to her, it comes out in Chinese and she replies in Chinese and it comes back to me and it's English. So it has hundreds, not hundreds, it has over a hundred languages that you can do that with. So it's wow. gonna be fantastic. Um, and I think, yep, Great. that's it. So <laughs> do you have any questions? Thank you so much. Any questions or comments? I am just continually impressed with the amount that you put out in your small department. You guys just do a really fantastic job. So thank you. I feel like you've really elevated our district in terms of celebrations and um, stronger communication. Appreciate so, thank that. You. Thank you. I'd just like to piggyback on that. Small but very, very mighty. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and it's noticed. It really, it, I think it's just, it really tells a great story and the stories keep coming. I love there's nothing better as a director to, I mean, we know about a number of them before, but to see the Everett Herald and to see stories like that and to see these. Well, we can only tell it because other people do it. So that's <laughs> yeah. the great part. It's a team for sure. Thank you. And, and anyone else? Students, any questions or? Okay. Um, I just want to um, thank you for, I'm going to bookmark the celebrations page at work, even though it's kind of breaking the rules because um, even today, I was just like, sometimes when you get so busy, you don't even, can't even see straight. But if I could go there and just smile, because I really <laughs> have, for my mental health, taken myself off social media. Um, so I thank you for that recognition, because um, there is so much to celebrate here. Every, like we saw from the, our monitoring, we see from the facilities, everything that was presented tonight, how much, um, how hard everyone works. And then for the student, the, you mentioned how much those core values champions, 
the young lady from Heatherwood who had a row of family, like they extended the row the to make sure her family. Face. Yes. Yeah. Um, that that's that's what makes it that's what makes it good. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for sharing our message. So section 14.0 is unfinished business and there's none for this meeting. Section 15.0 is new business. Ms. Shepard or Ms. Woods. I Dr. Woods, briefly. excuse me. No problem. Great photo. Photos. <laughs> and President Mitchell, members of the board, Dr. Salzman, and community members that are online or here in our room tonight. We are here requesting that the board approve a proposal brought forward by the Everett High School PTA to name the library at Everett High School after Larry E. O'Donnell. The Everett High PTA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting the students, staff, and education at Everett High. Larry O'Donnell is an alumni of the class of 1955. He is a well-known and beloved local historian and author, and it's my pleasure to introduce Principal Kelly Shepard to tell you more about this extraordinary member of our community. President Mitchell, School Board Directors, Student Representatives, and Dr. Saltzman, thank you for welcoming me back tonight for the second time. Um, I feel very humbled and honored to get to introduce to you and tell you a little about, about uh, Larry or Lawrence E. O'Donnell. Um, and it was a lot of fun. For those of you that are in Everett a long time know that when you need something historical, you call Larry. And um, on Saturday night at the Everett High Auction, we, I think, really surprised Larry with uh, announcing that you were gonna be considering this uh, school board action tonight. Um, and so I did all the research on this history with my friends in the community without letting Larry know. So Larry O'Donnell has loved Everett School District and Everett High his entire life. He began as a kindergartner at Jefferson, at the old Jefferson Elementary. Um, for those of you that don't know local history, that's the current office of the current location of the post office. Um, and then in his retirement letter in 1989, by the way, Larry, I'm not writing a three page retirement letter when it's my time, but what a gem that three page letter from April of 1989 is. But he wrote that Jefferson contributed in my eventual decision to become a teacher. So that impact of teachers to this legacy that stands here before us today. He then attended South Junior High, currently Sequoia High School, later becoming principal there. Um, when it was known as Port Gardner. So Larry saw school changes, building changes. Um, he then became an Everett Seagull, graduating in 1955. He uh, went to Everett Junior College and then Western Washington University and returned to his hometown to begin his teaching career at the new Evergreen uh, Junior High. I'm not sure Evergreen would call themselves the new school today. Um, in 1950, that was in 1959. He had 47 years of uh, career in Everett Public Schools, serving in multiple roles, including teacher, counselor, dean, vice principal, and principal at multiple schools, including Cascade, Port Gardner, Whittier, Emerson, Lowell, and Jefferson, and finished his career at the district's, as the district's director of facilities and planning. He, I think his proudest moment in the district might have been helping secure um, as a true historian, the funding to the support the demolition of the main building addition um, to restore the Everett High School main building to historic and beautiful form it is today. Um, you'll see a picture in the middle of the slide. It's kind of small up there on your screen, um, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't share. If you look closely, I believe uh, our own Mr. Gunn is standing in that picture as a young person didn't have white hair at that time. So zoom in on your own screen. I think he's the second one over. Um, he's also in the second one, but the title is wrong. It's not actually sports history. It was a facilities planning meeting. It's in, in around 19, I think it was at 89 on the photo. So forgive that error there. Um, so uh, 
And Larry wrote at that time in his same retirement letter that there's just too much people strength here, meaning Everett. And Larry knew the strength of community. After his retirement, he continued his lifelong interest in local history, writing and co-writing several books. Um, Larry, along with his brother Jack, and Jack is sitting behind me today, can be trusted to answer any historical questions, usually without looking it up. Tonight, Larry's joined by not only his brother Jack, but also uh, his uh, son Mike, as well as grandchildren and children, um, and I'll let him introduce them. Um, but we are just really excited to uh, and hope that you will approve a uh, renaming of the Everett High School Library in honor of Lawrence E. O'Donnell um, for his great commitment and inspiration to many kids, adults, and educators and community members throughout our community. So Larry, your legacy will live on forever and continue to inspire future generations. So, would you like to introduce your family that's here? There's, sure. there's too many for me to get all their names. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pleased to have um, several members of the family here. And uh, why don't you stand up if you're part of the O'Donnell group? <clears throat> and I might tell you that. <clears throat> what you're looking at represent three generations of O'Donnells who have gone through Everett High School. And uh, uh, I've always been proud of the Everett School District and proud of my family. So thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> when Kelly announced at the auction the other night uh, this honor, I have to say I was truly flabbergasted. I had absolutely no idea. And uh, it took me back to thinking about my time with the Everett School District. I started, as Kelly mentioned, in 1942 at the old Jefferson School. And so far, it's been a wonderful 81 year ride. I don't feel like I've ever really left the district. And as Mike Gunn could attest, I came to a lot of school board meetings over the years. <laughs> and uh, it's fun to be back, especially for this kind of event. I was the first in my family to graduate from, from high school. And uh, my mother and dad grew up in rural Kansas, where having a high school education really wasn't a prerequisite to shucking corn and plowing fields and frying chicken. Uh, they certainly were smart enough to be graduates. It just wasn't all that important. But the most fortunate thing that ever happened in my life is that they left Kansas in 1936, came out here. They didn't really know where they're going and settled in Everett. And I was born then in 1937. And frequently I would tell them, that's the best thing you ever did was move out here. Everett has been a wonderful place to live. I uh, <clears throat> got started in the district and then, as Kelly mentioned, came back. And in 1989, when I graduated from Western, there were teaching jobs everywhere. And I can remember a fellow came up from the Los Angeles County Schools and he said, we are opening the new, a new grade school, the equivalent of every Monday. And he was true. But I thought Everett was good to me. I want to come back here. And I've never regretted it. Uh, I had the good fortune to move into a house that I had admired from the time I was a little kid on a block that's still my favorite in town. And my wife and I and our three kids were there for 46 years. So <clears throat> during that 46 years, uh, we had a grand time and uh, I had the good fortune to continue working with the district as a consultant and uh, talked about bringing down that building in front of Everett High School and the pictures right behind you there. <clears throat> that was called, well, the official name was the Annex, but that was the nicest name it was ever <laughs> called. <laughs> And I can still remember the thrill because we had a lot of people that said, if we can take that down, uh, it will really improve that Everett campus. And I can remember being there that day. And as it came down, it was like an unveiling. And you could see this just splendid building. Uh, and I think Everett High School is one of the prettiest high schools in the United States. And I was so happy to be a part of that. 
Well, I could go on and on, but I know you have lots of business to do. I just want to thank the PTA for nominating me and Kelly for the role you played and the school board for uh, proposed action on this. I'm just honored and humbled, and I thank you. So, but yes, we would very much like some Sir, pictures. Okay. I wonder if maybe we can ask the board, we can request that the board of director approves the naming of the library at Everett High School, the Larry E. O'Donnell Library, and then maybe we can do some pictures with Larry, the board, and his family. Thank you. Mr. O'Donnell, I want you to know, because we have to vote on this in public meeting, this was the hardest secret, and I think the <laughs> best kept secret this district has ever had <laughs> you did it well <laughs> they did it well because it was how do we vote on this bef before he knows because then everybody's going to be telling him and so it was like do we just offer it but we can't offer it until those district votes so i mean this is a, really a joy this started we started naming things really with with joy stewart and PTAs that, that bring forward such things for their schools to honor their um, citizens, I think really is a delight for something we get to do here in Everett. And to honor you tonight, I think is a pleasure. So I will put forth the motion to approve the renaming of the Everett High School Library to the Everett, excuse me, to the Larry E. O'Donnell Library. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Students, do you have an advisory vote? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Then um, any um, any no's? The measure passes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can we get your family up here? All right. Did you hear that family up this way? Maybe as they're coming up. I just want to again thank you school board folks, not just for this honor, but the kind of service that you give to this community. You're doing as important a job as anybody in the United States. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with several different school boards over the years. And uh, I always admired the people that would run for school board and and serve in that position so thanks for doing that thank you okay family come on up larry you're right in the middle gather around you guys decide how the family is going to be organized <laughs> Lower the calls, <laughs> congratulations <laughs> Okay, can you just act like your family? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Wait, I got a little owl. There you go. Lincoln, look up here. One, two, three, everybody. One, two, three. And thank you very much. Do you guys want to do you want to be in one? Sure. Sure. Okay. Let's well, let's staff that need to be in one. Other Brenda is our PTA president who brought the motion forward. Yes, please. All right, Brenda. Lay across the front. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Here, let me take just a moment and introduce individually the folks. My brother Jack, his wife Mary, and I think more little Brenda. Not part of the family, but kind of feels like it. <laughs> Tim George, my uh, granddaughter Caitlin, great grandson oh. Lincoln, my son Mike. Of course, Mike Gunn, we're kind of family too, and Jeff O'Donnell, his wife Shauna. All right, thank you so much. Ready for one more? One, two, three. All right, thank you.
So now we'll move on to section 15.02, approval of the Everett Public Schools land acknowledgement revision. Ms. Grant. Good evening. It would not be me to say congratulations to what just happened. So I want to say congratulations uh, to the family, the O'Donnell family. Good evening, um, President Mitchell, the Board of Directors, Superintendent Dr. Salzman, and our student representatives. My name is Joy Odom Grant, and I am the Director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department here in Everett Public Schools. And tonight, I would like to present to you the Land Acknowledgement Revision Recommendation. Well, why revise? Why revise our current land acknowledgement? Since our current land acknowledgement was adopted, we continue to collaborate and communicate towards a common goal. Revisions allows us to correct, improve, and grow. With the current land acknowledgement, there is a factual incorrect term in the form of this reverence. In this form of reverence, the correct term should be Tulalip tribes not to Layla peoples. Thank you. This was an opportunity to engage leadership stakeholders in this revision. The involved who was involved in this um, envision, revision was the Tulalip tribes leadership the diversity, equity, and inclusion department's leadership, and the equity and access council, advisory council leadership. The 2023-24 equity and access advisory council meets regularly and is made up of community members, students, department, school staff, and the diversity and equity and inclusion department. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department very much appreciated feedback this winter from the Tulalip tribes. We respected the deep meaningfulness in the language provided of this recommendation of a revised Everett Public Schools land acknowledgement. We moved forward in engaging members of our Equity and Access Council. As stated, they are comprised of students, staff, parents, business, and community members. In a step-by-step -step process, the Equity and Access Advisory Council, we reviewed the current land acknowledgement while considering the recommended revisions provided and understanding the significance of the revision. After open discussion, several edits, several edits, and further contemplation, the Equity and Access Advisory Council agreed upon a statement that combines the current land acknowledgement from both land acknowledgements. Therefore, on behalf of the council, as the director of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department, I would like to present for your consideration and your approval the new land acknowledgement as it reads, we acknowledge the original inhabitants of the area, the Shnehub's people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. In Everett Public Schools, we strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. We want to continue to challenge and inspire our stakeholders to work towards creating equitable outcomes and an environment of inclusivity within the Everett Public Schools community. The Equity and Access Advisory Council, with much thought and discussion, 
we place emphasis on keeping the ending of the current land acknowledgement. We strive to create equitable outcomes and build a culture of inclusive belonging for all students, teachers, staff, and community. It is with gratitude and appreciation. Thank you for the opportunity to share this process with you. And now we invite the board for discussion and consideration of a revised land acknowledgement. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Can you put the land acknowledgement up just so we can reflect and discuss it? Yes. Um, first, I want to thank you, um, the 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 um, council, and all of the meetings you and every, a lot of people had with the Chile um, tribe. Um, and I know this was um, a lot of work to get here. So, are there any questions or comments? Uh, I just have some some comments. Uh, just thanks so much for uh, Joy and Peter and the. Uh, council for working on this and um, working with Tulalip on uh, developing recommendations on this and just uh, yeah thanks so much for all your work on this. You're welcome. This is Thank excellent. You. Any other questions or comments? I, I have comments. Yes please. So um, I want to thank director I, I appreciate director Atkins bringing the land acknowledgement to our attention and the fact that we had incorrect um, language and um, also to the folks that spent all the time working on this the um, your department and and uh, the equity and access advisory council um, it gave me an opportunity to actually learn a lot more about land acknowledgements <laughs> um, i did some research um, tried to better understand what the intent behind a land acknowledgement is um, and um, I believe, um, like all actions that we take as a school board, that the intent of this land acknowledgement, in addition to acknowledging the land that our buildings actually sit on directly, um, is to create a more inclusive environment for our students. And so in this particular case, our Native American students. Um, when I dug deeper into some of the specific wording, I was struck by the definitions of sovereignty and self-determination. Those two jumped out. So <laughs> I went to my dictionary to help me better understand what those words mean. So sovereign, sovereignty is, according to Merriam-Webster, a supreme power, especially over a body politic or freedom from external control. Autonomy is one of the definitions. Self-determination is free choice of one's own act or states without external compulsion and the determination by the people of a territorial unit of their own future political status. To me, these words suggest how a, a tribe might choose to organize or to operate politically and don't seem relevant to our charge as a school district. I would like to actually, um, I, I like the original with the fact that it was incorrect in terms of the reference to the people, um, but I would be interested in uh, fellow directors in terms of uh, striking the words we respect their sovereignty their right to self-determination and replacing it with the second sentence of our original um, land acknowledgement so i i, I thank you for that because i also um and please 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 correct me because i I think in my own education, the the if you're, and this is you know treaties, all that stuff. So, but it's the sovereignty and self determination when you're on the tri tribal, like within like the Chulalip, if you're up there in Marysville, versus and I'm asking, sorry, Director Atkins, I'm asking this question because I I admit my ignorance versus this land which we're on. So, because one of my questions was. A student, one of our schools that says maybe I am sovereign or I have self determination, but really they're under the teacher, they're under the principal, they're under stuff. So I did look at these words and say when you're when you're in Marysville, is it not different than when you're in our schools? So that's a question I'm asking because I'm ignorant, if that's all right. 
Yeah, well, uh, the Treaty of Point Elliot has quite broad geographic area that it does cover. Um, and since these lands that we, we are on currently um, are covered by that treaty, I, I, it isn't necessarily different in Marysville versus here, um, since both are off the uh, reservation trust lands, uh, but are still within, wholly within uh, the Treaty of Point Elliot uh, geographic area that Oh, thank you for that, because that, that was what it was. I knew treaties decided land, so thank you. Um, and so to your question about sovereignty and um, self-determination, how were those words brought about into this? I, I can just read the uh, land acknowledgement that the Tulalip Tribes acts, asks uh, local governments and school districts throughout uh, Snohomish County to use. So their exact wording is, we acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Stahopes people, and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on, and taken care of these lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. And it also adds uh, a sentence that is not included on this draft that we're considering. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Um, I think it's really important for us to have the words around sovereignty and self-determination in the acknowledgement. Um, and I personally would like us to also include that sentence around striving to be honest about our past mistakes. We really need to keep in mind the history of public education in this country, and especially um, the fact that there was decades and decades and decades of forced assimilation and cultural genocide that our government participated in and actively perpetrated. Um, and as a, a institution of public education, I feel like we have a responsibility to be honest about those mistakes. And while I do not know the specifics about how the Everett School District treated American Indian students in say the 1890s, I can't imagine that it was terribly kind, yeah. um, especially knowing uh, the history of, uh, especially how Marysville School District treated their native students and especially um, how uh, just as recently as I believe the 1920s, 1930s, uh, you had bars uh, in Marysville and Everett that explicitly said no Indians allowed. Um, and so I, I just, I'm putting that out there, but I, I do think that this is an opportunity for us uh, to really put that front and center that our native students and our native tribes especially uh, have that right to self-determination again just because of that history of um, Indian kids being forcibly taken from their families and put into institutions of education that our western government ran. I appreciate that and um, I appreciate that the Chile um, tribe puts that forward and but I, I do like our original one and this one that really does show reverence for this land and the people but really does move us forward to our goals for the future. So I appreciate your comment, but I think the last sentence, like you said, I mean, it's who we are. Um, and, but again, um, are there any other concerns with sovereignty and self-determination oh, or anything else, please well, open discussion. Yeah, so uh, Director Askins, you know, uh, when you talked about past mistakes, one thing came to mind and I, Joy or Ms. Grant, um, I wonder, you know, when, when Director Atkins said that, I wondered about like civil rights and the civil rights movement. And, uh, you know, just from the Equity and Access uh, Council, was there conversation about, you know, other people that? Yes, we did have conversation about that, but because we were talking about the land acknowledgement, we want to keep that front and center of the conversation. Okay. Yeah, because that was something we did see at, at the Everett Community College event. They have a land acknowledgement and then a labor acknowledgement, which I was like, ooh, that's kind of interesting. But just for the land acknowledgement is where I we're think, focused. Um, yes. I'd also like to comment, uh, you know, our, um, our country has a very checkered past with providing equity to a lot of groups. Um, and, you know, I could honestly not, not that this is any less important, but I could honestly make the case of not having a land acknowledgement because we have so many marginalized groups in our district 
that have suffered in our country in the past. And so the question is, do we create an acknowledgement for all of them? You know, which would be probably about a 20 minute reading at every school board meeting. Um, and I know that's not what we're here for tonight mm -hmm. to discuss immediately, but it does call into mind of, you know, they did do that at the Everett uh, Community College breakfast the other day. Um, but but we have other groups too. And we have, we have ones that are um, currently in our district that um, they're, their shared ancestry is creating conflict, um, you know, abroad in the world, but also even within our schools, unfortunately, um, as much as we'd like to, to hope that that doesn't exist, there are cases. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a bit conflicted on this. And, um, and I just, when I read the um, definitions of those two words, I felt like it was maybe just a step too far for me. And that's and and I appreciate that because it is something we have to read. We have to take it in for ourselves. If we read it, how do we honor this? Um, do the students? Do you guys have any questions about this? Because we also ask you to read it, and you're learning this in school and being impacted by a lot of this. Do you guys have any comments? Yeah, I agree with what Charles. Uh, you can get your mic up to you, please. Uh, I agree with what, I agree with what Director Atkins says. I think like the worst case scenario here is to be ignorant, and so I think we definitely need to address our past mistakes. Because the whole goal here is to move forward and like provide marketable outcomes, but we can't really do that if we're not accepting the mistakes we made in the past. So I think we need to address at least the country's history with Native Americans in education to kind of address how it can move forward. Because what it is, it's, it's a call to action. Um, it's called action and history. So I think in order to correctly like portray both, we do need to be um, like acknowledging of how the past was. Okay, yeah, because that's and I appreciate that because one of the things that I I do like having this at the start of the meeting because my words only what what was done to the people before us I think was the you know the original sin of this country and so to to, to start our meeting as a public meeting giving reverence to the land and the people I I do appreciate um, but. I, I appreciate your comments about admitting my, you know, our our hour is a global hour um, than just we've done to other people. But again, to to say at this meeting, to your point, Caroline, we've hurt these people and ignoring all the other people that we've hurt. So, any other comments or questions? Yeah. Let, let, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just wait. Um, I just want to thank the advisory council on this and actually also the student rep comments um, and also director atkins for for bringing it forward i think where i'm leaning right now is is the version that's brought forward because of the the process i i also imagine that this may change in a few years too as we evolve as a school district it does remind me of our study session last week that we are a constantly learning district and um, so just for full transparency, that's that's where I'll be tonight. And so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just want to state that on top of that, when we look at the words uh, sovereignty and self-determination, again, a lot of it is about making sure that we are respecting uh, Tulalip's sovereignty and self-determination. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, there was, uh, until very recently, like in the past few decades, a co concentrated, or not concentrated, concerted effort by our federal government and by state governments across this nation to assimilate and culturally genocide Native Americans. And this, this history isn't, this isn't that long ago. Again, the fact that I, I as a 26 year old attended a Indian boarding school that has been open since 1880, and is the, con the oldest continuously operating boarding sc uh, school still operated by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the fact that kids still are dying at these schools. Um, if, I like can, if, are... I can, if I can interrupt you though, because this is really about the land acknowledgement and I appreciate your comments about the, the boarding schools, but, and I, and, but I just really want to keep this on the wording of the land acknowledgement, please. Yeah, I, I am. Um, we can't separate the fact that our country is still running these schools from but, our work here but that's not our business we don't have them in our district and there's really no way we can influence 
than Do I have the floor? Um, per our previous time, or per our January time, we really did try to, we agreed to stay on topic and to limp, and to really restrict our time and repeating of things. We agreed that in January. Um, so I just want to keep us focused, please. I don't necessarily see how me mentioning our currently operating Indian boarding schools is, I, I don't see how that's off topic when we're talking about land acknowledgement and, and about Everett, our indigenous and, and, peoples. But in Everett, though, is where I'm trying to focus us. Yeah, and kids from our community are going to these schools. I was roommates with a kid from Tulalip. Like, this is something that's happening now, and we really need to keep that in mind. And I'm bringing this up also to just advocate for the inclusion of the language around we apologize for those past mistakes. Because again, these apologies are like incredibly important to making sure that our Native American students have that sense of belonging and feel, frankly, that this is that this is a school district and that these are schools that they belong in and that they can feel welcome in. And if we're not able to acknowledge these these things and these horrible actions that uh, we as a community did decades or a century ago, then um, it, it's going to be really hard for these kids to feel that sense of belonging. Yeah. Yes. Is it appropriate to make a motion right now? Um, yes, I think so. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the pro proposed revised land acknowledgement as it's been presented this evening. Is there a second? Second. Is that the one on the screen? It's one on the screen. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? No. Is there a student advisory vote? Sorry, I should have done that first, but I still want you guys to have your say. Yeah, aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank I, you. I do appreciate the discussion. I really do. And, and thank you for the, all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, section 16.0, upcoming agenda items. Dr. Saltzman, what is planned for our upcoming agenda items and meetings? Hey, thank you, Madam Chair, Board of Directors of the Public. At the April 27th special meeting, board members will attend the Washington State School Directors Association Regional Meeting. At the work study on May 7th, 2024, that session will engage in the Strategic Progress Monitoring Session of 4 and Sustainability Update. At the regular meeting on May 14th, 2024, that agenda contains the following. Recognition of PTSA Art Award. Recognition of the Northwest ESD Art Award. Washington State History Curriculum Adoption First Reading. Multilingual Learner Secondary Curriculum Adoption First Reading. Associated Student Body Budget Presentations. Authorization to Issue Contracts. Detention Center Educational Program Interlocal Agreement. Northwest Regional Learning Center Agreement and the Sonomish Discovery Program Agreement. Okay, <laughs> section 17.0, executive or closed session. There is none for this meeting. This concludes the March 26, 2024 regular meeting of the Everett Public Schools Board of Directors. The meeting is adjourned and it's a beautiful evening.